Hello, everyone, and welcome to both new and returning viewers. It's been way too long since the last video, so let's try not to dwell on exactly how long it's been. This is the first video I've made using KSP2 because I've been away from things. It's the first time I've played KSP2. So this is going to be both my first impressions about KSP2, as well as featuring the first thing I've made in it, which is a single stage two orbit space plane. The goal of this plane is not to do a particular mission, but to learn what a space plane should look like in KSP2. So I'm going to go over what this is, how it works, and how I'm going to use it to build planes that I'm going to use for future missions. This isn't yet going to be cracking the optimized, maximum, absolute best ascent profile that can be achieved in KSP2, but I think this should hopefully be fairly close to what an optimized flight profile looks like for getting to orbit. The propulsion for this is seven of the Whiplash ramjet engines and one of the Swerve gas core nuclear engines. There's also some ion engines on this, but we're just going to be getting to orbit here, so those are really just payload for now. Once we're off the runway, the idea is to stay real close to sea level and pick up enough speed so that the wings can naturally generate us enough lift to start climbing. We don't want to have to go in with a big angle of attack that's inefficient, causes more drag than we want, and we'll just be losing delta V. One of the things that definitely is an opportunity for more optimization here is I just put a 5 degree angle of attack on the wings because that was the easiest thing to do in the stock editor. One of the things that I really need to find is some of the editing functionality that we had from mods in KSP1. I'm sure the mods are out there. Uh, if you know some really good ones, drop it in the comments. One of the strange issues I had with this plane was with stability. I was using the same approach I had used to control planes in KSP1, which is to use trim controls for the pitch, and then just to do minor manual adjustments for the roll and the yaw. I was getting phantom roll here. I looked at the build and couldn't find anything that affected it. Again, one of the things I'm missing here is some of the excellent build aids that we had in KSP1, such as RCS build aid. If you're familiar with what might be causing phantom roll, let me know, or it might just be a build error that I overlooked. Our goal with the ramjets is to get as much speed as we can before we have to turn on the nuclear engine. The nuclear engine is really good in KSP2, even better than it was in KSP1. It was already quite good. The ISP's up to 1,450. Remarkable. There's going to be some really cool things we can do with that. Wings are just great. With a vertical no-wing approach to get to orbit, we need enough thrust to overcome our weight. That is a thrust-weight ratio of more than one. With wings, we just need enough thrust to overcome the drag necessary for the wings to generate enough lift to be greater than our weight. So we need our the product of our thrust weight ratio and our lift to drag ratio to be more than one. The lift to drag ratio of wings is quite a lot higher than one, so our TWR can be quite a lot lower than one and we'll still have enough thrust to keep accelerating and keep climbing. Reducing the amount of thrust we need is really important. It's more important than it seems like at first, and it's particularly important for a single-stage space plane. Eliminating two tons of fuel that we need on the launch pad is great, but that was mostly mass that we were going to burn off anyway and not have to deal with anymore, with the exception of the mass of the empty fuel tank. The mass of the engine would be there for the rest of the mission, whatever it is that we're doing. We'll look more at how this impacts the efficiency of the space plane once we get to orbit, and I come up with a metric for how well we did. For now, let's look at KSP-2 itself. KSP-2 is quite similar to the first Kerbal Space Program. This makes sense. The original Kerbal Space Program is awesome. If you haven't ever played Kerbal Space Program, you should go do that immediately. Details such as how the aerodynamic works and what parts are available are more similar than I expected them to be, and I would call this a pleasant surprise. It's nice to be able to transfer over a lot of the experience I had in Kerbal Space Program and to be able to just immediately build cool things in Kerbal Space Program too. I certainly have not explored all the features that are currently available in Kerbal Space Program 2, and it is also still in early access, so not all of the features are there. So I can't speak to all of what it offers, but let's look at what I see in it that's new so far. The most obvious difference is how it looks, and I really like how it looks so far. It's beautiful. 
Kerbal Space Program has never been about cutting-edge graphics, but it's always just looked great when a planet's come into view or you've overflown some mountains, and everything in Kerbal Space Program 2 I've seen so far does just look better than what we had in Kerbal Space Program 1. There was always some mods you could use to make things look better, but having it look so good right out of the box is definitely a, a great improvement. 1400 meters per second is about the maximum speed we're going to be able to hit with the ramjet, so we're going to turn on the nuclear engine. And from here, I'm just going to be making minor inputs, and it's just all about keeping the nose prograde and letting the wings do the work to get us to orbit. The editing tools in the VAB are still irritating at times. I'm hoping this gets better once I find all the mods I need to be able to do what I want. Being able to get specific angles on parts is definitely something I want. I still do not like the stock rotation tool in there. The VAB camera is still irritating at times. I am definitely enjoying the new feature where you can just click on a part to easily move the camera focus to that. That's a welcome change. But there is still some times where I'm trying to get a good look at something and it's not the easiest thing to do. I do really appreciate how a lot of the things we used to do with add-ons is now being included in the stock game. The new mission planner, for example, looks great, being able to see the Delta V in each stage fantastic. I expect that I'm still going to be planning things myself outside of the game, but I think this looks like a great feature for new players, returning players, just getting things done quickly and efficiently. For my own use, features such as the ability to pause the flight without breaking the craft or significantly impacting the flight is huge. For big complex flights, especially if I'm trying to record, this is no minor feature and something that I always wanted in KSP-1. Being able to bring up a list of every part in the craft is a complete game changer. This was already an immense help building something with 120 parts. Building things in Kerbal Space Program 1 with one or 2,000 parts, if you had a problem with some part that was in there, sometimes you had to take the whole thing apart to figure out what was going on, and sometimes you just had to rebuild from scratch because it was just impossible to select parts. So. That's a, that's a huge change for building complicated things. On the balance of things, I'm very impressed with what's in Kerbal Space Program 2 Early Access so far. What it really needs now is just more features. I eagerly await the ISRU mining equipment coming back, stock propellers coming back. I'd also really like to be able to build interstage fairings. It's possible you can do those right now, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. If you know how to build interstage fairings in Kerbal Space Program 2, hit me up in the comments and let's figure it out. Now that the space plane is getting near orbit, let's take stock of what it's going to be able to do here. The goal here was to get a good baseline of what an efficient single stage to orbit space plane should look like. One way to measure how well we've done is just look at the Delta V readout. Depending on what order we're using the fuel in, this either gives us around 36,000 meters per second or 46,000 meters per second. Delta V, that is how much change in velocity our engines are going to be able to impart on the craft if we use all of our fuel, is one of many measurements we could use to measure how far we can go. But in terms of orbital maneuvers, it is the best measure of how much we're going to be able to do in a single stage with this plane. It is, however, not the best metric for measuring how efficient this space plane design and ascent profile was. A lot of things about this design are going to affect how much delta V we have in orbit. Using different kinds of engines and fuel is going to affect that. We might need to use different kinds of engines depending on what kind of landings we might be doing. Needing to perhaps add more ion engines and more electrical charge production to go with that is going to affect that. So instead, what I'm going to use to measure how well I've done here is to look at the ratio of usable mass in orbit to total mass of the craft in orbit. Usable mass in orbit is going to include the mass of the fuel remaining, the mass of the tanks holding that fuel, the ion engines that are only used for orbital maneuvers, as well as the solar panels that are used to power those. The other mass, such as the empty fuel tanks, the landing gear, the wings, this is all now dead mass that we're going to be having to haul around for the rest of the mission. There are going to be some parts that are going to be in a gray area between usable and unusable mass. Most notably in the case of this plane is the nuclear engine. 
This is something that we needed to get to orbit, but it's also something that's going to be useful for doing things such as landing on and taking off of moons. I'm going to be including the mass of the nuclear engine in unusable mass for the reason that we needed it to get to orbit, but for most applications during a mission, we're not going to need all of the thrust that it has available. So generally speaking, being able to reduce the ratio of the total mass of the craft made up by these nuclear engines would be a good thing. There are plenty of other parts that are something that we're very likely going to use again on the mission. The landing gear, for example, is something that we'd use on every landing in a mission. However, using a similar principle as what we used with the nuclear engine, it's unlikely for most cases that we need it to be as heavy as it was taking off on Kerbin. So we're going to count that in unusable mass as well. So adding everything up and then dividing to get to the ratio, we find that just under 84% of the craft's mass once we've hit orbit is usable mass. That seems pretty good. It's certainly better than what we were able to accomplish in Kerbal Space Program 1. I expect largely because of the magnificent and I'd say suspiciously good performance of the new nuclear engine. So that gives us our score on the metric of usable mass ratio in orbit. This is going to be something I'm going to be able to use to compare different designs I try out and figure out which one's going to be able to do the most awesome missions on a single stage. It is, though, perhaps not as satisfying as measuring delta V, because delta V gives us a very concrete message of what it's going to be able to do. So for that reason, let's figure out how to relate usable mass ratio to delta V. To do this, we're going to start with the most useful equation in Kerbal Space Program, and I'd argue the most awesome thing anywhere, the classical rocket equation. This equation allows us to take the ratio of initial mass to final mass, that is, the mass of the rocket before and after it burns off its fuel, along with specific impulse, which, which measures the efficiency of a particular rocket engine, and use that to calculate the change in velocity that the rocket's going to be able to achieve. To briefly go off on a tangent, I still think it's a scandal that g, the constant for 9.81 meters per second squared, is in there. It doesn't have to be in there. There's nothing about this equation that's specific to use on Earth. It works equally well in deep space or orbiting a different planet. g is just in there because that's the convention of how specific impulse of a rocket engine is used. I would prefer that we didn't have it in there. We could just measure the specific impulse of a rocket engine in meters per second. It would directly tell you the ratio between the fuel used by the engine and the impulse it would give you. Everything would make sense. But no, we got to have G in there, and then we have to measure the specific impulse of a rocket engine in seconds, which is uh, irritating. To relate delta V to usable mass ratio in orbit, we're going to hypothetically assume that all of our usable mass in orbit is fuel tank with fuel in it. And then we're going to assume we're using a particular engine. In this case, let's use the nuclear gas core engine. We're going to substitute initial mass over final mass with this expression, which allows us to calculate that ratio using the usable mass ratio, as well as the fuel tank ratio which is the ratio between the total mass of a fuel tank with fuel in it and the empty mass. In the case of Kerbal Space Program 2, this fuel tank ratio happens to be 9 for all fuel types, which is very convenient. That was not the case in Kerbal Space Program 1. That will give us a unitless ratio within the natural logarithm, and we're going to multiply that times standard gravity and the specific impulse of the engine, which is 1,450 seconds. Since I mentioned it earlier, I feel obliged to say that this means that the real efficiency of the engine is a ratio of 14,200 meters per second between mass of fuel used and impulse produced. Solving for the entire expression, we get a delta V of 19,413 meters per second. So this tells us how much change in velocity the craft would be capable of if all of the usable mass in orbit consisted of full hydrogen fuel tanks. If we instead calculate with the specific impulse of the ion engines, we get 56,230 meters per second. This is a little bit more hypothetical because some of the usable mass would have to be ion engines and the electrical supply to run them off of. These are some great looking numbers and they leave me very excited about what's going to be possible in Kerbal Space Program 2 with a single stage space plane. 
So on that, I'm going to leave you with perhaps not the most exciting landing ever done on this channel, but the first one of Kerbal Space Program 2. I'm excited to say that you guys can expect some more KSP-2 content coming soon. Might be a space plane, might be a low mass mission. If there's, It could be a tutorial. If there's something in particular you want to see, please do let me know. If you are looking forward to seeing more, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.